All right, this is a very typical case that you'll see in a cone beam CT. This patient is a 60-something old man. Uh, all the patient identifiers have been anonymized. And he's referred for a radiopaque lesion seen at palatal to tooth number five. If you see it here in the palate, just beneath the floor of the maxillary sinus. And this is looking at it in the smallest slice possible. I want to turn that up a little bit. It looks a little bit more clear. You would get a little bit more signal to noise by looking at a half millimeter slice. So this was taken on an instrumentarium OP300. The dimensions are 80 by 80 by 60 millimeter. As you can see, it's a cylindrical shape field of view. So what do we see here? To me it looks like a relatively homogeneous radiopaque, or in cone beam CT we actually call it hyperdense. Why, don't ask me, it's still radiopaque, but the terminology is better in a CT to call it hyperdense rather than radiopaque. So we call this a uniform. I would call that well-defined because you can definitely see where the borders of the lesion are. It's not perfectly round. It's a little bit abnormal in shape. It's not continuous with the border of the sinus, not communicating with the border of the sinus. And then an important thing also is that it's not communicating with the roots of this teeth. So one thing you might suspect is condensing osteitis if you thought one of these teeth could be necrotic and causing a condensing osteitis here. I don't think that's the case. So if you've had experience seeing these, you should know by now what it is, what it likely is. And of course, as we review through a cone beam CT, we look at every slice, make sure everything looks normal. And this is a relatively small field of view, so there's not much to look at. You can start to see part of the pterygoid plates here. Part of the pterygoid process, and then you see the posterior maxilla. You see the greater palatine canal. You see the floor of the nasal cavity. And here lateral to that, you see the maxillary sinus. I don't see any inflammation in the maxillary sinus membrane. There I do see a little bit, a little inflammation. And this is not inflammation because we have thicker tissues in the nasal cavity. You expect to see a little bit of the soft tissues in the nasal cavity. And there we have the incisive canal. That looks fairly normal. There's a little bulge, but there's a lot of variation that you'll see in incisive canals. You see some little nutrient canals running through the mandible. This patient has some rather large lingual tori. I would comment on that. And of course you look very close at each one of the teeth. This one has a little bit of an inflammatory lesion, an apical hypodensity. It looks like tooth is it 12 or 13? Tooth 12. See, we're looking in the axial there. Teeth 7 and 10 have root canals. I don't see any lesions with them. You see a little hyperextension of gutta percha in tooth number 10. Interestingly, I, I don't see any bone resorption around that gutta purja. It does look like it communicates through the buccal plate, the buccal cortex of bone. But if that's asymptomatic, I just recommend leaving it alone. There you might you might comment a little thickened PDL, tooth number seven, but nothing very significant. So have you decided yet what you think that lesion is? 
something very common, although usually it's not as large as we see here. So I think the dentist was right to be worried about it, to refer it, to ask about it. But this is just a dense bone island or an anastosis. Of course, it goes by different names. But that's a very typical finding. And I'm looking at the root canals in the mandibular teeth. And bridge from 28 to 30. And everything else is looking pretty normal. I like to look at every one of these different sections that we have. It all seems like they all have a purpose. The arch section is good for looking at the dentition. You can widen the trough here so you can see more of the dentition because some of the roots are getting cut off. Again, if I didn't notice it before, I would have noticed the extension of gutta percha extending from tooth number 10. And then you scroll through like this. First looking at the maxillary teeth. You can also see the maxillary sinus. You see that inflammation in the maxillary sinus, the ACR lesion. Here's number seven with the post and core and root canal. That looks healthy. And then we'll come to number 10 here. If you want to change the, the range that you're looking at, but this actually shows us everything, the entire field of view already, so we don't need to do that. And now in vivo dies because it likes to crash a lot. All right, we got in vivo back up running. Back to our arch section. And I'm looking at tooth number 29 here. Looks like a little periodontal crater defect around it. There you can see, especially as we're looking in the axial plane. Doesn't that absolutely look like a crater defect on the lingual of tooth number 29? So that's something noteworthy. We don't have TMJs to look at. That's not in the field of view. Looking at the pano is good to give us an overview of all the teeth at the same time. And sometimes, like in this case, the super pano or the pano reconstruction is not that helpful. Volume render usually isn't that helpful. It's nice to look at. It's kind of a cool image. And I will look at it just to make sure I'm not missing anything major. But you can't really look at it and make any diagnoses. You know, here we're looking at our lesion. You can't really see it in that great of detail looking at the 3D reconstruction. You can enable clipping and go through it like this. Sometimes looking at the super Seth is helpful as well. But again, you can't see it in that much detail. Like the 3D view, this is just for kind of getting an overview of the entire image. So 
So really it's the MPR views that you should be spending most of your time and scrolling through one slice at a time to make sure you look at everything. Look at everything in the coronal, everything in the sagittal, and everything in the axial. And I'll typically spend a lot more time on these. I've already looked at this and written the report, so I've already spent the time. So anyway, that's a real quick overview on how to look at a cone beam image. How to diagnose something when it's common like this and you know what it is. You have a pretty good idea what the diagnosis is just based on the cone beam CT. So thanks for tuning in to Oral Radiologists LLC. Interesting cone beam case. Maybe this one wasn't all that interesting, but we'll get more new interesting cases as time goes on. So stay tuned.